Can you hear me? You can't hear me. Not anymore. Right. Is this, can you hear me now? Good. No. Is that a no? Huh, that's weird. Yeah, I can hear that. How's this? Better? Good. Let's see if it stays that way. Um, so I think we'll get started. We're a couple minutes after three. Um, I'm Bob Hinden. I chair the IOC. Um, we sort of as a result of thinking about the comments at the mic at the last, you know, in the open mic session um, at the last ITF meeting, sort of thought about what we could do to better inform the community about the IOC because it seemed based on some of the questions there wasn't, um, it wasn't, the knowledge was not as clear as it should be or could be. And so we wanted to try something different, which is this session where we can go over, uh, I can go over a lot more content about the, what the IOC does um, than can be possibly done at the plenary, given, especially given the community desire to reduce the length of the status talks. So, and I think if this is, this seems to be positive at the end, I think we'll probably repeat this periodically. Um, you know, I think it may, could be every meeting, but maybe once a year or something. Um, we also, we have a requirement to sort of do annual reporting, so this could well be it, so. So on the agenda is sort of just to first establish how the IOC was created, um, talk about uh, the operations of the IOC, how we do things, the financial model, um, how we do venue selection, and then um, you know, get questions and feedback at the end. So if you have specific questions, you know, we have mics and you can come up. You know, I'd like to get finished in the hour. And also note that this is not about the IETF trust. That's um, separate. I wanted to focus this on the IOC today um, and not, not get into the relationship with the trust. And just, there's a lot of, this is a very acronym rich environment, so I, you know, based, got some requests that it'd be good to define them. Um, most, hopefully most of you will know these, but for reference. And so th also this presentation is being recorded um, and the slides are available online. And so there's also some material in here, which is, um, you know, maybe intended a little bit more for reference. Um, and a lot of, or most, most of the material um, or the information about the IOC is, is on the web. Um, this is a picture of the website. It might even be readable. But, um, you know, so the, where all the financial report, where all the public information is, is on this site. We're also in the midst, in, the, in a project to sort of, um, redo the format of the website to try to organize it better and make the content um, more consistent. Um, but this is the current version of that. Okay. Is this better? Oh, much better. Okay, I'll do this. Should get one of those things you wear. Um, this is probably also going to make it colder in here. Um, so the I, the IOC was set up as part of the overall um, IASA or IETF administrative oversight or support activity defined in BCP 101. Um, it was established in 2005. 
Um, this was the history of this is it was part of the shift away from um, when CNRI was running the the um, the ITF sort of operation side. The ITF wanted to sort of have more uh, control over what it was doing, and the result of a long discussion uh, was what is now BCP 101. Um, you know, and the, the, it started with the original goal of uh, managing the operations and finance. Um, and sort of, the, and the other thing I like to sort of say and keep in mind is the IOC does not set policy for the standards process. You know, it's there to sort of implement, and I'll go into this more, it's there to implement the needs of the, um, of the standards process, but at the same time, the IOC has responsibility to make sure that the money is spent responsible, responsibly. So it's not, you know, it's not, we don't just write checks, so to speak, but, you know, there's always consideration for how much things cost and whether that's a reasonable expense. But, in, but most things are fairly separate. There are times when there are issues that, that sort of meet or have overlap. And the way we deal with that is to sort of talk to the, you know, the ISG or the IAB, whoever the relevant organization is. Do you mind water just in here? Is that my water or yours? I don't think it's mine. Do you want some water? Yes. Thank you. Um, and so these are the members of the IOC, and we have, um, well, actually, one of the ones who are in the room, I think Scott, Dave, Chris, Oli are here. And um, the, there's a conflicting meeting with the, um, that affects the ITF chair and the IB chair. And so a number of people um, who would be here can't because of that. I can't speak for the rest. Thank you. And you'll note on here that, as you can see, different people become, are appointed or become members of the IOC based on either roles or how they're selected. We have people who are selected by the NOMCOM, the IAB, the ISG, the ISOC Board of Trustees, and we have people who are in ex officio roles. All, everyone except for the IAD, Ray Pelletier, uh, is a voting member. So um, it, the, whether you're appointed by the NOMCOM or have an ex officio role, you, everyone is a voting member. And I actually think that this mix of people and, you know, mix of way people get on the IOC and that we have, the, you know, the chairs of the ISG or the ITF and the IAB um, and the ISOC CEO and president actually makes, I think it helps with the decision making process quite a lot because you have people who have a stake in the outcome. If they have concerns, it's important that they be listened to. And so I think that this, the way the IOC is formed actually is working very well. And there's been discussion about changing it, but I, you know, in my experience in doing this is, is this, this mixture of members is actually pretty effective. Um, so this is the structure. Um, and the reason really why this is here is to say that, you know, there's the main IOC, which is where, you know, decisions are made, but there's a number of subcommittees who work at a, you know, more detailed level on particular topics. You know, we have meetings, budget, tools management, RFP and bids, and legal. These are standing committees. Um, they, you know, like the meetings committee reviews different venues and makes a recommendation to the IOC. The IOC will then vote on accepting that recommendation. So it's, um, the full IOC is not going into detail on all issues. Um, we also create, um, subcommittees for a particular topic, but they're not um, standing, you know, they will solve a work on a particular issue 
and then disband. Uh, we have one now that's dealing with the way the ITF servers are hosted. And I think this may evolve into a standing IT subcommittee, but right now it's focused on um, improving the way the ITF servers are currently hosted. And, and in that sense, we'll probably end. And we've had other things in the past and will in the future. So the IOC has a number of responsibilities. Um, you know, f first is the finances and budget. Um, we have oversight over the, I, the administrative director. We do his performance review. We recommend to ISOC, you know, raises and bonuses and so forth. Um, we um, support what I call supporting the needs of the standards process, the ISG, the IAB, the IRTF, and, and the R RFC editor. Um, we have we select and provide oversight for contracted services. And I note that because it's uh, been a, I guess, hot topic, um, is that, you know, for the RFC editor related serve contracts, we do this, you know, in working with the RFC series editor. So it's, uh, we, we, there are both, both have responsibilities here. Um, the IOC is responsible for venue selection and sort of the, the operational side of the meetings. <coughs> this work is done largely by the Secretariat, but, you know, it, you know we, we hold the contract with the Secretariat. Um, and also the last one is support for the ITF's IT services, the data tracker, the, web st the websites, tools, tools development, et cetera, et cetera. So th this is the, the portfolio, so to speak, of responsibilities. Um, the point of this slide is that the, the IASA has basically two, you know, employees or contractors who are, who are really di providing direct support. There's the IAD and then there's the RFC series editor. Everything else is done by contracted services. Those are the only people we have direct relationships with. Um, and so the Secretariat meeting network services, the RFC Production Center, the publisher, RFC Publisher, we have a contract for legal services, and then we tend to have short-term contracts for individual projects. These are all um, contracted services. We, the ITF or the IASA does not have a, a large staff of people working directly for it. Everything else is, of course, volunteers. And, you know, this is different than many of the other internet ecosystem organizations like the regist registries and ICANN who have sta large staffs. Um, we do this differently. You know, of course, much of the content is, provide, is done in the ITF by volunteers. And I personally think it should stay that way. So I think this is, is a good way to um, operate this as opposed to having lots of full-time people whose job it is to do this. Um, decision making and consensus in the IOC, most decisions are unanimous. Um, it's, we always, in addition to this, we always do votes on financial decisions and important, what we think are important, you know, where there's a roll call and everyone votes. Um, occasionally, everyone does not agree and we will do things by majority. This has happened a like, maybe three or four times since I've been on the IOC. So it doesn't happen often. Most of the time, um, everyone agrees, but occasionally not. But, you know, we do need to make decisions. This is an operational group, you know, and you can't stop things because there's a deadlock. Um, and all decisions and votes are recorded in the minutes. We, we sometimes do e-votes, and the results of that e-vote will be recorded in the minutes. Uh, transparency and community feedback. We try to be as transparent as possible. 
Um, most information we have we publish on the website. We send the email to the community. Um, but there is some data that is not shared. Um, there's personnel related, financial negotiations, RFP responses, uh, and really things like that are kept confidential. Uh, and if you read our minutes, you'll notice that sometimes it'll say, you know, the contract is negotiate a contract for some amount, but it'll say confidential. So we, you know, we have a, un, um, there's, there's behind the scenes, there's a version with more information for our records, but the, what's public, you know, we take out the information that we don't think is reasonable to disclose. Um, the IOC seeks, seeks, seeks input from the community uh, where we think it's important to get feedback. You know, we regularly do this for statements of work, you know, or we send RFIs out. Um, we will, um, if we're thinking about a new meeting in a, re a new region, we'll ask for feedback. You know, there's ex recent, somewhat recent examples. We, there was an issue with the Beijing meeting with um, things about the hotel and um, requirements on attendees. We brought this to the community and got the information of the community, which helped us uh, re sort of negotiate that provision with the, the hotel. I think that was a very successful process. And so I think w we will continue to do things like that. Um, and the IRC also works with the ISG, with the IAB, with the RFC editor, when policy and implementation roles overlap. And some things are very clear and very separate. Some things have, you know, decisions have, may have financial impact. And, you know, if it's not something that can be accommodated in the budget or we think it's um, unwise, then, then there's a discussion. It's not a... We try to have a very uh, useful working relationship with the other groups. This is another reason why I think it's good to have uh, the chairs of the other groups as members, as voting members of the IOC. It tends to pull all that together and it tends to avoid having the different groups going off in different directions, creating conflict. And you'll see um, emails sent to the community that you know, for instance, there was recently one on remote participation, and that was sort of sent by both the ITF chair and myself. And so that, that's, I think, you know, and remote participation is a, one of the areas where there's overlap. It's like what, you know, what services do we want? What's the right thing for an ITF meeting? But the same, how do we implement them? What's feasible to implement? And that's an area where working together works better than just trying to do things independently. So, finances, everyone's favorite topic. So, sort of two introductory slides before we get to see numbers. Um, so the ITF is not formally, legally, in some sense it doesn't exist, you know. It's not a corporation, it's not an LLC, it's not registered anywhere, it just, we just do what we do. This certainly causes confusion uh, with other standards groups from time to time, you know, whether uh, I still heard that the, I think the, the European Union does not recognize the standards that the ITF produces. It's like, even though you can't ignore the internet, but officially they can't reference them or something. So it's, you know, there's a lot of history here. But we're, so we're not a formal legal organization. You know, we're not part of the UN, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're officially an organized activity of the Internet Society. Um, and this means that all the money flows through ISOC. Um, we don't have our own bank accounts. We don't have our own uh, receivables or debts or obligations. So it's not, you know, when you look at the, Financial statements, you know, it's a little different than what you would see from a, from a, you know, a business um, or some sort of for or nonprofit entity because, you know, we're not, you know, we don't get the, if we have a, if we do better than budget, it's not like we get to keep the money and put it in the bank account. So it's, you know, we, tr we create a budget, 
we manage to it because it's an important part of ISOC's budget. It's a, you know, the numbers are certainly non-trivial. Um, and it's good that we do what we say because this means they, um, the ISOC treats us with a lot of independence. Um, so in some sense, I, you know, I was trying to think of a way to describe this. And I think it's more like a, a department or profit center inside of a company where it's not the whole company. It's like you don't get to keep, you know, if you make money, you don't get to keep it. But it also means if you lose money, you don't have to go into debt. So it's, you know, you're part of a larger structure. Um, you know, so in some sense, our bottom line for the year is always zero. It's like we, we have, uh, well, you'll see the next slide. You know, we have revenue that we attribute to the ITF and we have expenses. And that's, and then, the, then there's, you know, it would be a, a big negative number, but then ISOC make, makes a contribution that sort of makes it zero. So it's, um, it's a, well, I think it's a very nice arrangement, actually. Um, and the ITF budget is incorporated into ISOC's overall budget and then is approved when ISOC approves the overall budget. The ISOC Board of Trustees does not s approve the ITF's budget as a separate line item. It's just always incorporated in and then approved as part of the overall ISOC budget. So, um, so as I was saying, the, the meeting fees and, and sponsorships always pay for the meeting costs itself, and then they also pay for part of the ITF's operations. Um, it's, so the meetings have a surplus, essentially, and we use the remain the surplus to pay for the things that happen you know, all the time, you know, the website, secretariat support, data tracker, internet drafts, all of those things are paid for by the surplus and by the ISOC contribution. Um, ISOC also provides support for helping finding meeting hosts, sponsors, bits and bytes table sponsors, um, administrative support. We have someone from ISOC who's to doing the minutes for the IOC meetings. Um, we have accounting support regarding the budget. You know, we work closely with ISOC's finance department. Um, and I think the, I mean, I have a, several hats here to wear, um, both the IOC chair and I'm also, you know, a, the IAB appointed member, or one of the IAB's appointed members to the ISOC board. So I sort of see this from both sides. And I think this is a real win-win situation. Um, you know, I think it's good for the ITF we have, we work in a financial structure where all of, you know, where we have continued support. We're not having to always be adjusting up and down based on, in, you know, individual fundraising events. And it's also good for ISOC to have the relationship with the ITF. And it works well in that we don't get, the ITF is not given direction by ISOC on what to do. It's you know, really, they're in a supporting role. It's very good. And ISOC, this helps ISOC with a larger framework of supporting open standards. So I, I'm, I think this is a very good relationship. Um, we should be thankful to them. And I think they get a lot, ISOC gets a lot of benefit from having the ITF as, you know, one of the pillars of ISOC. So this is my very, very high-level view of the finances. Um, so, you know, it's mostly it's intending to show the direction of flow of money. Um, so, you know, we have direct revenue for registration fees, sponsorships, things like bits and bytes. You know, the ice creams. There's usually ice cream on Thursdays if they can find a sponsor. Um, sometimes the welcome reception, all of those are sort of, you know, we, we show as revenue. And then we have expenses, we have the, the actual meeting costs, the rooms, the food, you know, the putting the power strips in, all, you know, all of these tables, everything, the, everything, everything a venue charges for. Um, and we also have the continuing operations, you know, the website, all of the other things, the RFC editor, um, 
other, the other things that make the whole process work. And then, at, and then ISOC, which is sort of support as a supporting organization, support, where our support comes from, contributes money that makes the whole thing, you know, gives us a zero balance, so it covers the whole thing. So this is the, you know, where the money goes and where it comes in from. So um, the next section is sort of, is, you know, actual financial data, um, and starting with the 2012 results, you know, for last year, and then talk about the budget for this year and sort of projections forward and some history. Um, I won't go into the detailed spreadsheets in any detail. We can come back to them if there are questions. Um, part of this is just because I wanted, you know, I knew this, these slides are going to be available online and it was a good way to include the information. So the overall results for last year, uh, we were higher on revenue than budget by over, you know, 308,000. We had good attendance, sponsorship. We had bits and bytes. Um, we were had lower expenses than budget by, you know, 220,000. Um, we had some lower meeting costs, and we had budgeted for some transition expenses that turned out not to happen because we um, retain or did a new contract with the current contractors. Um, tools development was over budget by about 40k. And the result was the amount uh, requested from ISOC um, was below budget by about 490,000. So it was a budget-wise very good year. Uh, this is the I chart, so we can we can have that for reference, or you should be able to find it online. Um, this is sort of the overall picture from last year, this year's budget, and um, next two years, which are advice to ISOC. The board, ISOC board asked us to provide, you know, when we do a new budget, is to provide sort of an outlook for the next two years, or the two years following, so that they, they can do planning. And so we're about, well, you can see the numbers, but, you know, for this year, we're, you know, we're, ex seeing, we're expecting revenue of over, $3 million, we have expenses of a little over $5 million, and then an ISOC contribution of about $2 million. So we're about, you know, a five and a quarter million dollar operation, um, and ISOC pays, what is that, about close, close to half, you know, about 40, 45 percent of that. Um, this is sort of another more detailed view. It has more breakdown of what the individual costs are. Um, I, we can, if someone has specific questions on that, I can do that now or later. But um, And this is sort of the level of budget that the IOC sees when it approves it. Um, but, you know, it breaks it down into pieces, you know, the more defined pieces. Um, and then this as well shows the, uh, you know, last year, this year, and the next two years. So um, this, I've started doing these slides for a couple of years, and it's to show the trend. Um, and, yeah, it, I mean, it certainly looks like it's going up, I think, <laughs> is my conclusion. Um, I'm not, I, we tend to be very conservative about the out years, and uh, I think we've showed it was going up more than it actually has. We've also, um, there's some other sponsorships that are in the works that may actually cause this to not grow as much, because I think we'll have a better, a better idea of what the revenue will be, what the hosting and sponsorship is. But this, this is the current trend. Um, you know, you know, you can look at the ISOC contribution on the bottom. You know, we're around a little below um, two million, but it, it looks like it's growing to about 220 or 2.2 million. I mean, it's not a. We're not seeing million dollar changes. We're seeing, you know, over this is it's like a couple hundred thousand dollars. So it's not a, it's not a giant amount of, you know, percentage wise, it's not that big. But, you know, it is something to watch anyway. I, 
you know, at the moment, ISOC has good sources of overall revenue. Um, if that was to change, then we would be having some different discussions. But I, you know, I, that said, I think ISOC is very committed to supporting the ITF. I think it's essential for, IT, for ISOC to have this, the relationship with the ITF it does. Um, and so I, I don't think we would see too much pushback, but, you know, we would certainly want to be more, more um, maybe circum. well, I don't know. I, th I think we're doing the right thing. I don't think we're being extravagant with the money. I think we do it very responsibly. Um, you know, we, as I said, we, we don't have a big full-time staff. You know, it's easier to make adjustments with contractors and, and service contracts. So I, I'm, I'm not too worried about this, but it is something to sort of watch. Um, the next one is, is sort of the same trend, but it's the breakout of where the expenses are. And, you know, you can see there's not, there's sort of growth in a couple areas, but th there's not like one big area that sort of jumped up. It's, it's all very incremental. Um, some of it is just, you know, hotel costs, venue costs seem to be going up a bit. Um, but uh, there's, not, there's not, I don't think, one thing that is jumping out at me that where, you know, where we're seeing things going out of control. So this is the end of the financial section, and we'll get to venues. No one is jumping up to the mic yet. Maybe the next section. I'm sure. So, um, yeah, given the debate on the list regarding Orlando or discussion on the list, um, this, this, you'll see material in here because of that, uh, trying to answer some of the questions. So the current venue selection process has been in place since November of 2010. Um, it was, I, I, I would describe as a, a result of feedback from the Maastricht meeting, which was so the two th November 2010 was Beijing. Um, and, you know, we had some interesting experience at the previous meeting in Maastricht. Um, and this resulted in, a, uh, in several changes to the way the IOC approached this. Um, so one of the things was, you know, and, and this was something that was, I think, developing, but moving from what was before that, uh, I think like having three, several meetings in the U.S., a meeting in Europe, and occasionally in Asia, to a cycle where we try to have one meeting in North America, Europe, and Asia sort of rotating, which is what we're doing now. And then with an, the possibility of an occasional meeting in another region. So this was sort of a big change to what was the plan of record at the time. And that we, we were going to have many fewer meetings in North America. Um, there was a clear preference from the community for you know, what I call one roof facilities where you can, the, ho the rooms and the meeting facility is in the same, air, you know, like here, essentially. Orlando has a, has challenges, but it, it's not that one, you know, or walking, walking from the hotel to the conference center, I think is acceptable. But, um, but, we, you know, we try to do things like this or, you know, like uh, hotels where it's just in the same building. Um, there's clear preference for that. We like city center locations um, where it's easy to get to restaurants, have alternate hotels. I think Orlando clearly fails in that regard. Um, we like to have reasonable travel. Um, we like to not have the same set of people always having to do a very expensive long trip. So that's mostly accomplished by um, rotating the venues to different continents. Um, and then the other change we made was to have the contract to have the venues under contract three years out. It was I don't know if there was actually a schedule, but it it, it was they were done much later, and you, we found that we had much less choice in selection of venues in finding the kind of venues we wanted. Um, I, I think we're getting better costs. It's, I'm not sure it's um, both costs and particularly hotel room costs by doing this. But it may, you know, it's like the last three years were in the big recession and that depressed a lot of hotel costs. 
the economy is getting better. You know, it's, I'm not sure in this case past performance is an indication of future performance because if the, all the hotels raise their prices, we're, we, we're not, it's not like we're a group who takes over all of Las Vegas. Um, you know, we, we have, we, we get, I think, good relationships with hotels, but we're not as big as other groups who have much more buying power. So, but I think it's worked out very well. I think we're getting better terms. I think it's allowing us to do these other things in ways that were much harder if we were doing them much closer to the, when the meeting happened. So there's a, a timeline sort of to think about. You know, about four years out, we select the regions, you know, using this one, one, one star model. Um, three years out, uh, that's where most of the work happens. Um, cities are identified to look at venues. Um, we do site visits. You know, the city list is usually refined. We do site visits, the reports from the site visits. Um, the meeting com committee recommends venues, sort of reviews these, the results of this and makes a recommendation to the IOC. Usually it's for a particular venue. Sometimes it's saying, we think these two are good. They have these, um, you know, strengths and weaknesses and then the IOC decides. The IOC approves that. The, the ID goes with the secretariat and negotiates a contract. And then once we have it under contract, the city is announced. Um, one thing that we're, a change that's in progress is that in the past we were um, not, we were announcing the city um, when there was a contract signed, you know, you see plenary slides, you know, with a particular city, usually a picture, but we were not, not announcing the ho actual hotel or venue hotel until um, right after the previous meeting. So we're trying, you know, we've gotten some feedback that it would, be, it would be helpful for some people to know the actual hotel earlier. We've done that for the meetings this year. We're going to see how that works out. Um, you know, there's some concern that this might make it harder for people to get rooms inside of the hotel block because some people will book very early. They may then cancel at the last minute. But, you know, it's got some, yeah, I think it's more positive than negative. So we'll see how it works. And if it seems to work well, we'll, we'll continue doing this. I'm not sure there's too much advantage in announcing a hotel more than about a year out because at least based on my experience, you can't actually book rooms um, it with hotels more than that. So it's sort of useful, but not as useful. Um, and then three months out, and this is something that's more recent. So one of the side effects of doing contracts three years out is that you need to go back and you even, you know, you do a site visit before the contract, but as you get closer to the meeting, it's actually good to go back to the hotel because three years is a long time regarding hotel staff. They could have remodeled. A whole bunch of stuff can happen. And so we've started as a regular thing doing site visits around three months out, plus or minus, um, to just um, review things, meet the, lo the current local staff, the local staff who will be there during, you know, our meeting, build relationships with them, um, see if there were any changes, sort of verify, you know, the networking plans are still feasible, just a bunch of stuff to make sure we don't show up, you know, Wednesday before and have a bunch of surprises. Um, and so I think this is, this is a side effect of, you know, when you were just booking a year out, it wasn't such a big deal, but doing it three years out, it, I think is very necessary and it seems to be working well. Uh, I have a quick question, if you don't mind please um, on the previous slide just curious what what happens between four years and three years out that that's what the slide makes it seem I was just curious what the point was of picking the region a year before you're even thinking about the cities um, it's actually we've just we've all we've always done the region selection or announced it very early I'm not sure it's a good question I mean it's probably not that useful, actually. 
I mean, I could see considering cities as part of the region. It just, I was just curious. It seems odd. But. Well, so, one, okay, so one thing, maybe Joe will say this too. Uh, one thing is, you know, part of this is, is sort of looking for people who can host meetings. And so if, if they can see that we're going to meet in Asia, then there may be people who say, oh, I might be interested in hosting. But Joel? So, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's the stated principle that the IOC had um, that got discussed a lot on the mailing list, which was, um, you know, how do we take the ITF meeting to where people are? And the ratio was designed to do that, but the ratio doesn't actually find hosts. And so um, you need time between the time you've announced what region it will be in and when you find a host is what my sense of that is. I mean, it doesn't always work that way. Uh, in my understanding of the ratio, uh, several years ago, the meeting that we recently had in Atlanta would probably have been in Asia, or the previous one in Vancouver would have been, had there been a host in place at the right time uh, in order to make that mechanic happen. Right. I have a slide on that coming up. Um, the other thing I would observe is that the further out you plan the meeting, um, particularly when, when you've, because we've defined the dates, right? The dates uh, go along with the regions, and the dates are currently defined out to 2017. That's an interesting piece of leverage with hotels because they know that we can't change our dates, um, or at least that we profess not to do them. Now, I've seen the IEEE, for example, move a meeting into conflict with us. Um, because we both define our dates very far out, and they simply moved one. Um, so that does happen. But um, the dates actually do go along with the very early uh, selection of, of regions and announcements. Yeah, and the, the latter is a very good point, which I forgot to include on the slide. Part of the announcement of the region is we do select dates, and Ray goes through a process of looking, with looking at other groups, you know, that people might be attending to see if we have any conflict. So we try to set the dates. It's, yeah, I, guess, I think it's actually more about the dates than the locations um, far enough out so at least most people don't conflict with us. Yeah, I mean, there's a very small number of organizations that actually pick dates five years out right. um, because uh, we don't know if Western civilization will exist in five years. So some things are certainly speculative. But um, those that do, you know, we have conflict lists, and pe people do collide with us, and things are inconvenient, but that's not our fault because our dates are all out to 2017 now. Right. It was annoying that the IGF, the Internet Governance Forum, decided to meet on top of ITF last time. Uh, also, I just wanted to mention in, you, regarding your point about uh, announcing the hotel much further out than, than previously. I really appreciate that. I like to plan far out. I like to get an idea of things. So I think it's great. Okay. Thank you. Pete. Yeah. So we're planning dates five years out, uh, cities four years out, and then identify. No, well, cities don't. I mean, we, we have. Regions four years out, cities three years out. Uh, Right, cities, yeah, you need to have a city to find, you know, with a hotel to do a contract, yes. Uh, and we would be able to do cheaper if we did it in reverse order. Well, not completely reverse order, but if we started choosing cities but didn't have the dates fixed, we would be able to get cheaper venues because they're using venue, the, the fact that we've chosen the dates as a, a way to raise the price? I don't. I don't think so. I, I thought that's what Joel said, but there's a lot of ways you can signal to hotels in negotiations. Um, certainly, when dates have been very close. Uh, so, for example, the Dallas IETF in 2005 was, I believe, negotiated, which is while this was being transferred from Fortex seminars to uh, the, the IASA process, uh, was, I believe, negotiated something like six months out. Um, certainly, um, if a hotel can't meet your needs or things are inflexible, um, the having fixed dates means 
you don't get to use that as a negotiating position, not that the hotel necessarily is going to prey on you because of it. But uh, you certainly can't go, I mean, they're mindful of this. Obviously, when you're dealing with the region, um, the hotels in the region are all competing for your business. Right. So, so also, I'll add that, so the, what actually happens in the meeting committee is, okay, so, we're, you know, we start talking about where would be good locate, where would be good cities for, you know, some IETF meeting. And so we say, okay, how about this list of cities? Then AMS, they have a very good meeting planner. They go off and look at venues, see what venues there are in those cities. So, you know, they have to be available, and then we compare, you know, we start comparing the results. So it's use, and the nice thing about three years out is it's, you know, you tend to sometimes get multiple qualified venues in different cities, or and you have choice of cities. So it's, you know, I think we're not losing leverage for price based on this. Um, if you say uh, cities identified to investigate, uh, how many cities are usually uh, identified as option? I mean, yeah, five, probably plus or minus something. Uh, there's not an ex usually exact number. Um, I'm wondering if options are available, whether IOC uh, asks for community feedback which options are better and less good? Well, so we have done a survey a couple years ago where we asked people to sort of rank cities for meetings. But what I mean is uh, discussing concrete options. Well, the, the, if we do that, we definitely will lose negotiating power a lot, I think. I mean, what I mean is uh, well before uh, starting the negotiation. Well, if they know the community says we want to go to, uh, yeah, let, let's say I, here. As, as I said, if there are a sufficient amount of options, uh, why not ask for community feedback? Be, because a lot of the, the, I mean, there's things that, you know, the information we get from hotels, like the financial side of it is very important. That's not material we can disclose. No, no, no. I, I'm not asking any uh, so NDA so what, what like would, let things. Me, let me ask you the question. So what would you have us disclose? I mean, for example, for ITF 95, I think, uh, location area is Europe. And if you guys identify three cities as options, uh, it would be useful for the community to discuss or give feedback on these uh, location options. So, uh, sorry. Well, we have done that in some cases, but you know, it's not that there. The thing is, I don't think a city is enough. I mean, let me cite an example, and it's sort of mentioned in another slide. We looked at, we were looking at a venue in Berlin. So, you know, so it is in Berlin. But when we found we did the site visit, it was not, there were not restaurants close by. The venue coming up, which is announced, is like right in the middle of the city and there's lots of places. So I think we would have to disclose down to the hotel level for it to be very interesting or useful. And I, and I don't think we can do that and still be able to negotiate a good contract. Because in cities, there's good venues and bad venues. It's not just the So I'll use, I'll use Dallas again as a foil. Um, Dallas is a pretty big city. Um, it takes about 90 minutes, if you're lucky, to drive around it in a circle um, on a freeway at 70 miles an hour. Um, we had at least three, if not more, venues for that meeting in 2005 that we were considering. Um, I don't believe that the community community on the basis of feedback would be able to um, say, yes, Dallas is a great city because it's imminently walkable and these venues are close to downtown. Um, in fact, um, you know from the one that we picked that uh, the, two, um, the two reception areas in the hotel are a quarter of a mile apart, um, so the building itself was quite large. Um, so 
I'm not sure that city information is that useful. Um, it certainly sends a signal to um, the people who are bidding on the IETF's business um, that, that we're committed to that location. So I think that's a bad thing to open up a negotiating position with. That said, if you have a multi um, uh, a multi-year contract with a hotel provider and you're saying, uh, should we go back to Minneapolis again, um, where we know the venue is known, and we had at the time a contract with that provider, that's different um, because we've already determined the price <laughs> associated with that. And it's a question of dates and flexibility and so forth. Yeah, and uh, let me uh, say a little more about that. So. If people have ideas for where we should meet, please tell us. You know, we try to listen and can look at it. Um, we also have, especially for venues we've met in already, we've had pretty good success with, you know, repeating in certain locations. You know, it's, there's a lot less unknown about it. And we've gotten, you know, like the past and the next meeting in Vancouver, we've got, we actually got very, we think we got very good rates. So, you know, if you have feedback, especially on, you know, you'd like to meet again in, well, I'll use Minneapolis as an example, because that seems to come up from time to time. But um, if you have particular, you know, you like something or, well, and usually we know when you didn't, but if you'd like to go back to a place that you thought worked out pretty well, then that would be very good feedback, because we, we sort of have relationships with those properties or chains and can likely get better rates if we, you know, have more, I mean, you know, if we give them more business. I mean, you get a better deal the more money you spend, if that makes sense. And that doesn't have to be just for a single meeting. Hi, just one curious question. So we keep, you keep talking about losing the negotiation power. So in terms of the finance, how much money that we lost if we don't lose the negotiation power? How much price being jacked I, up? There's no way I could possibly I, I don't know. I, I can tell you that, you know, seeing hotel rates that are under $200 is a lot better than more than $200, but I can't. But what about how, how much IOC signed for the venues? Let's forget about the hotel rates. Hmm? Yeah, it's very hard to quantify okay. in general. I mean, we have obviously specific numbers for venues under contract. But okay. Well, this has been more fun than the previous slides. Um, so <coughs> let's see. So uh, now we're talking about the criteria we use to select venues. Um, so, you know, the way I think about this, is the first and most important thing is that we can have a successful meeting. You know, if we can't, if there's not enough rooms for working groups, if there's not enough room for plenary, you know, all the things we do at the, you know, it's nice to have wide halls. If that doesn't work, then none of the rest really matters. So that's the, I think, the, the highest priority here. You know, we need to be able to have a network. Um, you know, obviously there needs to be, we like to eat. Um, you know, there's, there can be issues of meeting space costs and room costs. Those are, I think, the most basic things. And if that doesn't work, then, it, you know, it doesn't get considered very much. And so, you know, but having a successful meeting where there are enough rooms and, and we're, as I've come to learn, we're actually different than a lot of other organizations in that we have many parallel meeting rooms but then we also need a you know room for plenaries where everyone shows up, and not all venues do that, and that sort of limits our choice in where we can meet. Um, that's something I didn't know before I got involved in this, but it actually sort of you know I, in some sense I'm surprised you know when we ask AMS for okay how about these cities you know it's like you don't get like ten venues in all of these places because a lot of hotels or things that have meeting space don't have both. It's like one or the other. Um, so it's it's a, not quite as um, our requirements in some sense are a little more unique than other groups. Um, you know, I tell you, and these are all important. I'm not sure I'm, these are priority. Other, I mean, the, first, the highest priority, again, is whether we can have a successful meeting. You know, we like to have cities or areas where 
There's over, overflow hotels nearby to give people choices in where they stay. You, you know, especially if you can find hotels at lower costs, you may not want to stay in the meeting hotel, but you might want to stay down the road. It's nice if you can walk. Um, we, we, like, we clearly like to have make it easy to find places to go eat or drink, uh, not have to always have a car or you know take the train if you can. Um, we like their, the, the area to be reasonably safe. Um, this is something I think we find is sometimes fairly challenging to evaluate. You know, we've I think in the past have been using the um, U.S. State Department travel reports, and I think I've come to believe that, that that sort of tells you it's safe to have meetings in the U.S. and everywhere else in the world you should be scared. And it's not really like that. So, and especially like you know, if you look up the crime statistics for Atlanta, you know, there's clearly areas you don't want to go. So it's not at all that clear. And we're, we're, you know, working with AMS to sort of find out better sources of information. And there may not be a lot better sources of information, but we'll, we we at least understand that you have to filter what you read there a lot. Uh, and you know, there's in a particular country or city, there's places that you can go fine, and then there's places you can't. But you know, when you go meet with a hotel and they tell you you really shouldn't walk outside at all, that's we listen to that, which we have heard. Um, we also want there to be you know possible for most attendees to get visas. You're not trying to say careful here. I think good is the right word. You know, we can't, I don't think you could find venues where every possible person who wanted to come was, you know, guaranteed to have a visa. I think that w we wouldn't have meetings anywhere. But we certainly don't want to have blocks of large groups of attendees to not be able to make it based on visas or visas not even being available. Um, and then travel. You know, we like hub airports if we can. You know, lots of, with reasonable connections, you know, not excessive cost. <clears throat> and then we try to do it in a way that not everyone is always having a long and expensive trip. So I'm um, just to go back. So I mean so this is sort of the process. It's not a an algorithm. You know, there's a lot of the data is not always exactly the same. So th there, there is an element of uh, people reviewing the data and making what seems to be a reasonable decision. And I think this, in the, pa in the well, the reason this next slide is here is that I believe that, you know, this is the rest of the meetings for the, you know, through the end of 2015. And I think all of these venues meet the requirements on the previous page. You know, I, th I think um, um, Orlando actually happened before this and before we started doing this. And, uh, you know, I think we might have a different outcome if it happened later. I, or doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Oh, yeah. well, then I'll go first while Pete. you're walking back here. So if you go back one. You, you made it sound to me like travel costs and available places to eat outside were secondary to venue will support successful IETF meeting. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I don't think these are. This is not a priority list, must, I mean, except for the you know successful meeting. They're all factors. We try to find places that meet all of them. There's Ooh. going to be various. But clearly, I mean, travel cost for one. If it's too high, it won't be a successful meeting, full stop. I agree, right. Or and if the hotel rooms are too high. Right. Or if the hotel rooms are too right. high, or if the travel pain is too high, or if or the restaurants are not available and therefore people can't get back in a reasonable time right. or whatever. Completely agree. And Or okay. if people are it, view it to be unsafe to go there. It, you started to sound like you were going down the path of these aren't essential to the successful meeting and no that was good. not not my intent and you'll see I have a slide later which talks about some 
specific reasons why we rejected certain venues, and you'll see some of those things there. Hello, um, Philip Lurdley. I just Hello. wanted you to uh, talk a bit more about Hawaii. A Sorry, a little, a little louder. Uh, could you talk a bit more about the Hawaii venue? Because Hawaii strikes me as being uh, fairly inaccessible from a travel point of view. Doesn't it take a take a very long time for everybody to get there, which in some yes. sense it's fair. Yes, I but will, <laughs> but I, let's save that for the next slide. Uh, I will, because it's on the list. Thank you. Joel. Uh, well, you were on the next slide. Uh, you're right. But the, I went the next slide from this was actually the one I was going to comment on, and not on the specific venues, but... Um, Hosts that provide, I mean, there's a, there's a diversity of what constitutes useful input from a host, right? Um, in some cases, the host is merely providing money. I, I would imagine in the case of that 2015 host, they're probably doing the network too since they've done it twice before. Yes. Right? So there's a great deal of variation. Uh, the host in Berlin is actually providing the network uh, connectivity, or one of the hosts in Berlin, for that meeting. So um, there's a great deal of variation in what hosts do. Um, hum, some hosts um, contribute money and sponsorship and have a nice public face, but some of them want other things out of the, out of the meeting, and that does actually impact location choice, or I should say it impacts the hosts that you get in some locations in some fashion. And I think there's been a sort of big debate in the ITF and whether or not that matters in the sense that um, I can say having volunteered on the network team, it's sometimes really helpful that the host provides pieces of infrastructure um, that makes things in locations that otherwise might be very hard, um, like Vienna, because uh, if you've worked in a UN-operated convention center, that's not an easy place to work but Telcom Austria, for example, was able to make that work. So some venues that actually don't work for the ITF without a host work because they have a host. Right, and I think there's also other variations on that, that where there can be local conditions that you could only have a successful meeting with, with a local host who can deal with the government or the whatever the issue is. Um, it's not, you know, it's not as common, but I think that's certainly the case in, in some places. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, what I was not seeing on your previous slide was that basically that set of conditions evaluates differently depending on whether you're trying to just make your life as easy for yourself as possible so you always stay in the meeting hotel, you come to the airport, you get in a taxi or the van shuttle or whatever and go to the meeting venue. And if, if you're trying to do the meeting on a bu total budget, where you actually are looking for the very cheapest local transportation options, you're not going to stay in the meeting hotel because it's too expensive and so on. You end up with a very different answer as to what's acceptable or not. So, for example, and I hate to belabor the point because I know you can't do anything about it. If you were trying to do that here, you can get two and a half miles away by local transport. Then you either got to walk or take a $20, a $15 taxi ride or whatever. So it evaluates very differently from that perspective to what you would do if you'd just got in the van shuttle at the airport and come here. Thank you. Um, yes, I don't disagree. You know, that's, we do try now to find places where there are alternate hotels within reasonable distances. It obviously varies. Yeah, all, all I'm saying is you've got to take, I think, both perspectives when you're actually evaluating the venues. Does it meet the criteria that that group of people who do it this way or does it meet the criteria of this other group of people who are very cost limited and do it that way? Yes, and we do try to do that. Yeah, not to belabor the point. Um, there are something like 200,000 hotel units within 10 square miles of this location. So um, there's actually plenty of hotel here. It's actually getting there that's the problem. But I mean, I mean, I don't see this. I don't see this meeting as being in a subject of much debate because. As far as I know, this was being discussed before the IOC even existed. Um, certainly the original IOC chair indicates that we're having discussion about the IEEE meeting in 2007, which means we're talking about a decision that was made six or seven years ago now. As I've at least wanted to say to some emails, or maybe I did actually, 
you know, if we had a time machine, we could fix a lot of these problems. But, I, yeah, we can't go back. I, no, I understand. And As an experiment, this one sucks because the people who created it um, aren't really part of the organization except maybe for uh, the IAD, who's been here almost that long, and um, the guy who's getting off uh, the uh, ISG chair position. Those are the only people in the organization that have been here as long as this, I mean, in the decision-making role as long as this venue has been selected. Right. So uh, this meeting venue is a really bad place to have experiments if um, the time it takes to carry those out is measured in decades. Right, and so I, you know, it's in two things. We certainly get that we should have lower cost alternate hotels within reasonable distances. We, we do consider that. It's always on the things we look at. Um, and the other thing, just if you look, go back in the history, you will see other venues like this that were isolated and stuff. And, you know, the, the criteria has changed from a longer, well, the group is maybe, no, not even bigger, but so the criteria has really changed, and it was not looked at before. So Hawaii, next topic. So um, there's actually a fair amount of history about how we ended up in Hawaii again. As you, some of you, well, at least I was at the first Hawaiian meetings. I think I have a T-shirt in my draw that doesn't fit anymore, um, but I do have it. Um, and, and so there was some desire in the ITAF to have another meeting there. We went through the process of actually discussing it. And, and then there was a long period of time where the ISG specifically said we don't want to meet in Hawaii. So we didn't. But the feeling, the thinking changed. We brought that, you know, consideration to the ISG. And they said it would be fine. In fact, everyone on the ISG at the time, from all regions, we're very supportive of going to Hawaii. So we went, and, and, and I'll honestly say I wanted to go to back to Hawaii. Um, and, um, but it, it's not just because of me wanting to do that. So it was based on that feedback that we investigated venues in Hawaii and ended up in Honolulu in uh, November of next year. Did that answer your question? Um, I mean, perhaps I'm wrong. Isn't it? Isn't the travel time, if you kind of averaged for the for the IETF attendees, the travel time? Well, it depends where you're coming from. Clearly. Yeah, it's that's what I'm saying. Uh, averaging across the attendees, would it be, uh, be similar or same as the others, or more, much more? Well, so if you're coming from Asia, it's fairly convenient. If you're coming from the U.S. West Coast. It's not so bad. It's longer from the East Coast, and it's a much longer trip from Europe. So it's like, you know, we're going to Berlin next time, and that's that gets changed around. So it's, you know, I think it's one of these, for some people it's better, and for some people it's worse. But that's true of a lot of these meetings. But Berlin must be within 10 hours of, Asia and the West Coast, wasn't it? No, it's a five-hour trip to Hawaii from San Francisco. It's like uh, yeah, yeah, you know, Berlin, Berlin is. And oh, Hawaii, Berlin is Hawaii's like, yeah, Berlin. 20 hours, I think, from Europe, isn't it? So, uh, Something like that, yeah. But it's about, for me, I mean, I live on the West Coast, and going to Berlin is... Ten hours? No, it's more... So, so I'll move on. Um, and this, these are the meetings in 2016. And on the meeting cal online meeting calendar, you can see the um, dates further out into the future. Wait, 2022. That's a long time from now. So, um, do you want to go ahead? Or yeah, I just wanted to, was debating whether to even mention it or not, but your, your point, uh, and I think Joel made the point too, about how, um, you know, it, it's a little bit of a, of a problem when the decision, I mean, 
looking at venue selections as, as an experiment and then saying, well, gee, but, you know, that decision has always been made years ago with criteria that have changed since, so it's not really fair, um, is very valid, obviously. Um, but I think, you know, and much as I hate to, to do this, but I think John Clemson <laughs> mentioned on the mailing list that we keep running into the situation where we go to these venues, people complain a lot, and the answer is always, oh, well, that was made a few years back. But, you know, we went to Orlando before, um, a venue that I think maybe had fewer problems than this one, but, you know, it's hard to remember as a few years ago. Um, but the same kind of issues, isolated, you know, nothing around, couldn't walk to it. Um, Dublin, you know, more recently. So I think we still... You know, I'm not really sure exactly what I'm trying to get at other than we seem to keep repeating problems and then there's this big flurry on the mailing list and the answer is always, um, yeah, we understand, but, but the bad choices were always made under an old set of criteria until they happen again. Um, and maybe the problem is just that we forget which venues were particularly unpleasant and why, uh, such as being isolated. I'm not sure how to respond to that. I mean, other than the way I have already. I mean, I mean, I guess I'm asking to judge us on what's you know the venues we booked out into the future, as opposed to I can't do anything about the past. But I think no, I, I, I don't think, think we're going to fair. have these problems in the future. Okay, I, mean, I think that that's very fair. It's just that we keep hearing, you know, that after previous. Problems. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, the pipeline is pretty long, right? So it takes a while to work through the the issues that are either old or unfortunate. Um, I mean, we were long after the IOC was created, we were still going to meetings that had been booked by Alveza, right? And not that I have any fault with Fortex seminars per se, but that was a completely different organization that made those contracts. Um, so I, I think, I mean. Personally, I think all venues are a compromise, and um, having worked on the network and been responsible for it, I have definitely um, ended up uh, building networks in venues that I didn't want to use because they were compromises that were not made in my favor. And um, that, of course, is reality. You build networks where the people are, not where you want to build them. <laughs> um, but, I mean, I, I think th there will always be... Um, some compromises that um, result in discomfort for somebody. And to the extent that we can minimize the discomfort for everyone, I think we win. Um, um, at least that's my sense of it. I want to add one, two things, actually. The first is that finding a suitable venue for a group this size with the requirements we, har we have would with our fixed dates is very difficult to begin with. I mean, it isn't like you get 20 answers from, from anywhere when you put it out to bid. Uh, the other part is that I think it's important to remind ourselves that the three regions we're talking about are not the same size. Right? I don't really care if a meeting is in Paris, Oslo, Rome, or mm, Prague because I have to fly to some, some hub in Europe, usually it's Frankfurt in my case, and then go from there. And the, the additional travel time, it's a couple of hours, it doesn't really matter, okay? Say we were to go to Singapore, which is in Asia. It takes 23 hours and 40 minutes to fly there from Washington, D.C. via Tokyo, okay? Once you get to Tokyo, which is 10 hours from where I live in San Francisco, it's another seven hours down to Singapore. That's really a lot of travel time to do in one day. And maybe we need to redefine our sense of wh where the, how, you know, we just remind ourselves of, of, of the size of these regions when we make these kinds of decisions. So in terms of travel time to Hawaii, yeah, it really depends on where you start. I will continue. Um, so this slide is, you know, you only see the ones we select. I, you know, be, it would sort of be nice. I wish I could share you with the ones we projected. Um, 
But so these are some reasons why venues that would have otherwise been good, um, you know, we didn't select, you know, and you know they come right out of the criteria that, you know, we we evaluated one location. Actually, we're just looking at it again. It's gotten a little cheaper, but the room rates were just way too high. You know, the meeting space was nice. It was a nice location, but you know the 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 minimum cost for rooms was, you know, over $300, and I'm pretty sure I know what the reaction would be. Um, we, you know, rejected a venue based on general safety concerns in the city. Uh, we've rejected other venues that did not have nearby restaurants and alternate hotels nearby, or you'd have to get on the train to get to them. Um, we've rejected a venue because... Uh, one group of ITF attendees couldn't get, would not, there wasn't a, a process to get a visa. Um, we've also rejected because of the travel costs for all, all attendees would be very high. So, you know, we, I, you know, a lot of times it's like more general reasons, but there's some, some venues that in other ways would be very good that we rejected because it didn't meet this criteria. So um, so I pulled together, I got the data from the Secretariat, and I got to learn a lot more about Excel. So, so this is the breakdown of IHF attendees by region. And um, I think, I hope you can read this, because I can't quite read it on my slide. But you know, you can see that the majority of attendees are North America, Asia and Europe. And so, so that's the big block, and this is from ITF 85 back to 79. Um, and, you know, so this is the balance. It obviously changes depending where the meeting location is, but, you know, it's, um, I was actually surprised that, well, yeah, so we'll see this vary, and I think it will probably stay like this. But then, then I break, you know, if you see it on the top, there's, the regions that are not as um, not as many people come. So I have another slide which just shows those. And what you know, it was basically you know, in this discussion about meeting in another region, I wanted to see what the data was about how many people were coming to the ITF meeting. I mean, I don't look at it doesn't look at mailing list participation, but these were people who actually were here and you know registered. And so you you can see that. You know, South America, Latin America, and Caribbean has growing is growing. It's what 16 people at the last meeting. Um, I don't know what the numbers are for here, and so you know, this I think this is good data for looking at where you know if we do decide to meet in another region, um, you know, it's part of the justification because there is participation, and so. We, we have started looking at venues in Latin and South America. Um, we had one serious offer to host a meeting there. Um, we did a site visit last month to Buenos Aires and Sao Paulo. Um, and so I think if the ITF is convinced we can have a successful meeting there, um, then we will request feedback from the community on this because this, this is you know, not the normal rotation uh, it is um, a longer trip for most people. Um, it does vary a bit. And so I think it would be good to have feedback. I think there's reason why this, the ITF community should consider this because we, you know, we are seeing participation. The Internet is growing a lot in this region. Um, but, you know, it's if we want to see what the community's response to this is. Ah, and then I think this is my last slide. So um, some people have asked why we've had three consecutive meetings in North America, you know, ITF 86, 85, and 84. Um, so, you know, as we've just talked about, Orlando was scheduled a while ago to be adjacent with IEEE. Um, there was discussions much earlier about doing that. You know, I think it's one of those things at the time this was Made. It made perfect sense. I triple E was had had meetings here before and liked it, but I can't change the history. 
Atlanta is um, more interesting, or that this was Atlanta was supposed to be earlier, and the ITF chair actively requested that we move um, the Atlanta meeting to later because we had a we have a or had a I think it's we've met our obligation. We had contract with Hilton Hilton Hotels. And we had to have so many meetings in so many venues. And we had a contract already for a, for a meeting in Atlanta. And we, under that contract, we could move it, but we still had to have a meeting there. And so the ITF chair requested we move it to later um, in order to resolve. Because at the, that time, um, Chinese ITF attendees were having a hard time getting visas into the US. And this meant they would not be qualified to be on the NOMCOM because it was hard for them to, I guess you have to go to two out of three meetings. And so if they couldn't get into the country to go to the meeting, then they couldn't be on the NOMCOM and that didn't seem fair, which I would agree with. And so we move meetings around and, and schedule that to be a meeting not in the US. And so based on the contract, this was at Atlanta was as late as we could push it out, but still have a meeting in that hotel. It turned out it worked very well, but we ended up with a series of North American meetings. And then Vancouver, um, as we announced at the time we announced it, uh, was selected because we couldn't find a venue that could accommodate, accommodate us in Asia and was affordable. And you know, you saw those numbers on the earlier slide, and so it just um, I think we, we do find it more challenging to find venues in Asia than we do uh, in the other regions. Um, the cities like Hong Kong tend to book up very early. Um, I'm not sure of all of the reasons, but it's just, I think it definitely has been more challenging than the other regions. And, you know, we ran up into here. We wanted to, um, you know, we wanted to complete our three-year plan and have a venue, and we found um, Vancouver was available. We actually got very good rates there, um, and it was uh, wasn't quite the plan, but it, it's sort of as close to Asia as you can get and still and be in North America. So it was it was a compromise, but it was largely because we we were very confident that if we booked the hotel um, that had very high rates, um, that we've been in a lot of unhappiness on the mailing list. So it was a trade-off. So this is how we got to have three meetings in North America. You know, you can look at the future committed meetings and you'll see that, that this will get back to the regular rotation. And so questions and feedback. And particularly would like to know if you thought this was useful, uh, if you'd like to see it again, um, if there's other material we should cover um, or anything else. And officially, we have five more minutes. Uh, yeah, I think it, it's useful. Thank you. Good. I appreciate it. I agree that it's useful. I'd like to see it again. And I think you just shortened operational plenary by about half an hour. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it was sort of clear. I think my experience from the last, the last meeting is it, we were compressing it so much that it was confusing. And you know, I'd rather do this on Sunday and provide more information. I'm really impressed that at this point, Murray is still that kind of optimist. And with that, I think we're done. Thank you. <laughs>